joined by Senator Marco Rubio of Florida. Senator Rubio, great to talk to you again. Hey, thanks for having me on. Let's start with this one. I mean, your colleague in the Senate, J.D. Vance, was uh, outside of the courthouse in New York this morning just giving his uh, overview analysis of what an outrage the whole thing is, how despicable he finds the whole trial. As you see this and Michael Cohen, the star witness, and all the media focus on it play out in New York, what are your thoughts as somebody who serves this country and, and loves this country? My thoughts are that we have sanctioned other countries for doing this in their politics, as anti-democratic, as basically the targeting of the opposite, the leading opposition candidate in the next election, not with one trial, but with numerous trials, in the most one of the most liberal counties in America, with a Biden-supporting judge, a Biden-supporting prosecutor who doesn't even go after violent criminals, but has charged them. Uh, on this uh, on this on this ridiculous bookkeeping charge that they've extended to a felony by finagling federal law for reasons that I can't even explain how crazy that is. Um, it, it's just and, and then on top of that, the president is smeared every single day by including witnesses in this trial like Michael Cohen. And if he responds, he gets fined and now threatened with jail. This trial of all the trials, I think, are ridiculous, all of them. But this one in particular is the most ridiculous. It makes the country look like a third world banana republic, like a kangaroo court democracy. It's an outrage. It's a complete and total outrage. If that trial was brought in any other jurisdiction in America, just a normal, regular, middle road jurisdiction, there's no way they get a conviction. If Donald Trump's last name is anything, no other person, there is not a single other person in the world who this prosecutor would have charged with this, with the same set of facts other than Donald Trump. So the whole thing is, I think, an embarrassment to the country and an outrage. And I think people see it for what it is. Senator, when it comes to the, the, the that last point is, I think, the critical one, uh, the issue of the American people seeing through this. Not all of them, obviously, are going to see truth and reality. But how would you describe your confidence at this point that this campaign sort of generally, not just New York, but more broadly as well, of legal or of lawfare, you could say, uh, the legal assault on Donald Trump is politically backfiring. Are you seeing that already? Or do you think it's too soon to tell? I think even Democrats are embarrassed by it, which is why they barely talk about it. I mean, the commentators giggle and you know, CNN is like wall-to-wall coverage, even though they can't cover it. They're, they're in the courtroom. Like, I guess someone's texting out what's happening. But beyond that, like the average everyday hardworking person, they see it for what it is. Even people that aren't going to vote for Trump, even people that may not like Trump. No one is under any illusion about what this is about. And of all places, Manhattan, where you have a district attorney that basically if you kill a couple people, you might not even be charged. I mean, you'll certainly be out on bail waiting a trial and then they'll you know, drop the charges to something lower. You've got a, a city where they, this DA has notoriously not gone after violent criminals and given people the eighth and the ninth chance to go out and reoffend. But they bring this charge and with this much resources and time. So I think people know there's no way with a straight face to argue that this trial is a legitimate trial or it is anything other than, than political. And I, and I do think that among it's certainly motivating a lot of Trump supporters. But I think it's also influencing a lot of other people that are asking themselves if, in fact, this guy is so terrible and he's so bad and Biden's so good, then why are they afraid to run against them? Why are they doing everything possible and to keep him from being able to campaign and and uh, and stand for election. In fact, if you read some of the press coverage, they are flat out are saying, why aren't all of these trials happening beforehand? All these trials need to happen now. They need to happen right away. We need to, they've got to figure out a way to bring this to trial before the election. They all want this to happen now because they, they it's, I believe, their only way they think they can beat them at this point. Speaking to Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, uh, and Senator, I'm sure you've seen that with all the stuff going on in the world of prosecuting uh, Donald Trump, the polls have him across the board ahead in the swing states and mostly considerably ahead and in some cases ahead in every swing state. So the election, if it were today, which we know it's not, it's many months off, but it would look very good for Donald Trump as it stands now. Um, Would you want to be a part of this if offered? Have you discussed being a VP with former president trump (laughs) never i've never talked to anybody on the campaign about it i've read about it in newspapers but i've never heard it and i the reason i'm not trying to be coy the reason why i don't spend a lot of time thinking about it or talking about it is because frankly there's only one person on the planet who knows who that's going to be and that's donald trump not his advisors 
not the people with inside knowledge of the campaign. He's the only one. He'll make that decision, and he's the only one that knows. So hearing it from anybody other than him is really not something that I would put a lot of credence in. Now, look, just to be mentioned, I guess, you know, is an honor in and of itself. And I would say this to you. Look, these people, I truly believe if Joe Biden gets another term, these people will destroy the country. They are doing it already. Just think about immigration. Ten million people. How many are in three years? How many are going to come in over the next four, three and a, four and a half if he gets reelected? OK, just that alone. The, look at the damage he's done to us around the world. What happened with Afghanistan? Since that moment, Ukraine's been invaded. Uh, Israel's been attacked. Not being a lot covered every day, but China is constantly harassing the Philippines and Taiwan. That could break out at any moment. North Korea is firing missiles again of greater and great, greater lethality. The world's gone nuts here at home. we got pro-Hamas. I never in my wildest dreams that I ever believe we would see pro-Hamas uh, sympathizers of terrorism taking over college campuses and flying the Palestinian flag over our campuses and disrupting uh, graduation ceremonies and finals and classes. Do, All this do you think on, on the campus protester center, do you think that's a, a, a real legitimate challenge for the Democrats politically or do you think it'll fade away? Well, I think it's a challenge because it's not just about the, the issue of the month. The issue now that they're focused on is this issue of Hamas and Palestine and their hatred of Israel. But this is the same movement, by the way, the same group of people that are constantly arguing that the U.S. is an evil country of colonizers, that we're imperialists, uh, that this is a nation founded on white supremacy, that the world is divided between victims and victimizers, and we are the victimizers. And, and, and uh, so it's an anti-Western, anti-U.S. sentiment. That are the same people that tomorrow the cause will be something else, but at its core is they hate the country. They want America destroyed. They don't view this as a special country worth saving. They view it as an inherently terrible one that needs to be torn down and rebuilt into something else. And that includes not having borders and things of that nature. So that movement is an enormous liability because it has become a core of the Democratic Party. Not every Democrat. A lot of Democrats don't agree with them. But that's where they get their activists. That's where they get their staff. That's where they populate the State Department and all the other agencies of government from. These are the people that help them raise money. Who funds these groups? We know now. It is people that have given millions and millions of dollars to Democratic causes who are funding this, this movement or the groups that are the seed money for this movement. So it's a huge liability because it pulls Democrats further and further away in their policies from the everyday American, including some who are registered as Democrats or independents. And that's why you're seeing Trump doing well among working class Hispanics, working class African Americans, working class people across the board. The Democrats have moved so far to the radical left because of this core base of their party that it is more and more people can't coexist with them politically. It seems also that Biden, who's, in my view, spent his entire life just trying to find whatever the thing is that he's supposed to say for the most popularity among Democrats in the moment. I mean, I really think that has been what his political career has been devoted to. He seems to have been stumped a little bit here on this issue of, uh, you know, Hamas and Israel and the pro-Palestinian and anti-Semitic factions on campus and all the rest of it, to the point where he even started talking about, I mean, you've worked a lot on a uh, foreign affairs side of the Senate and foreign policy for a president to seemingly bend the knee on an issue as important as arms provision to Israel when it's in an ongoing military campaign. I mean, this is because he's really worried about losing Michigan. Is it that simple? Yeah, well, and I think there's two two things happening here. You've got one element of the Democratic Party that supports Israel, wants us to support Israel. And you've seen some of these members of Congress sending letters and criticizing it. And then the other element are the people in his campaign, the people in staffing different levels of the State Department and and his political advisors that are saying, you know, we've got to do something to appease this group, because if this group stays home and doesn't vote for us, we're going to lose the election. And so he's trying to have it both ways. He wants to go around saying, I'm ironclad with Israel, but then he tries to appease them by saying, but I'm going to cut off their weapons if they go into Rafa, or I hate, I'm not pro-Israel, but I don't like Netanyahu. So they've tried a lot of different strategies to try to have it both ways here. This is not the kind of issue you can have it both ways. You're either with Israel or you're with the terrorists. You're either supporting Israel's right to destroy this group that did these horrible things, or you're not. You're in favor of that group surviving and coming back and doing it again in the future. And, uh, and, and this is not something, this is not a needle he can thread, but he is trying to balance that internally because he's, I imagine, getting a tremendous amount of pressure from elements of his own staff, I would imagine, and, and so because they're a core of the Democratic Party, but of the donor base and the political advisors who are basically saying, if we lose Michigan, we're finished. 
If we lose in Minnesota, we're finished. And, um, and if these voters stay home across the country, young people and so forth, we're finished. So um, in an election that's supposed to be close, I imagine they're very worried about this element of their base that uh, not coming out to vote. And they're trying to appease them, and they're doing damage to the country. As a, we're speaking to Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, and, and to that end, uh, Senator Rubio, I know you're a University of Miami guy uh, for law school, right? So you're you Miami. I'm a Florida Gator. Let's, I mean, we got to get that right, you know, because that's my where I went to undergrad. And... I was going to say next. I mean, you and my wife are both Florida Gators, and uh, she yes, she corrected me recently. She just said uh, UF. I I think I said U of F. She said no, it's just UF. So I'm learning the Gator ways. But uh, about all these schools and the protests and everything that's going on. There have been some states where this has been, with, you know, with very large universities, very, very popular university systems, where this has been very absent. Uh, you know, there have been little bits of it here and there, and it gets shut down very quickly. Um, how do you feel as a uh, as a UF alum, and and why has it been different? Is it really just your your colleague, uh, former colleague in the Senate, Sass, as the chancellor, has just said we're not doing that nonsense here? What what's been the difference? Yeah. I, I think there's no doubt that's been key to it. It's you know, if you allow groups to say set up camp and put up tents and take over the buildings word gets out and people are going to gravitate they're going to go there they're going to say this is the place we need to go because they're allowing them to stay and then that encampment builds and then these professional agitators come in and guide them towards what's the next step they hand out guides this is how you get arrested this is how we resist this is how we break into buildings these are your rights this is what you need to do this is how to cover your face so no one can take a picture of you and, and then not hire you in the future when you try to get a job I do think that if you've seen some of the commonality, some of the biggest issues here have been in New York and Los Angeles, a little bit in Washington, D.C. These are big cities where a small group of students can become a magnet to bring in these professional agitators and, and you know, part of this whole anti-American movement who are always looking for a cause to latch on to. And they join. And suddenly, you know, it, it, you've got these encampments going on and you've got straight up violence and chaos. These are not protests. These are riots. These are uh, unlawful demonstrations, disruptive and harmful. And even if every, and I, I always laugh in the media, says, well, there's no evidence that they're outside agitators. Okay. I mean, there is, and, and, and there's plenty of evidence. Who's printing all this stuff, making all the signs, these fancy tents they're in and all that. But even if every person in those encampments was a student, in most of these universities, you're talking about a very small percentage of the student body, very, very small percentage of the student body uh, that that's participating. But they're joined by these outside agitators, and they're willing to be violent and disruptive and illegal in what they do. And, and they've got and caused tremendous harm to these institutions. For the life of me, I don't know why anybody would want to go to one of these schools right now. Senator Marco Rubio, Florida. Senator, as a fellow Floridian, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. All right. Go Gators. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell my wife. She'll be very excited about this. She's very pro-Gators. Um, we'll take some of your calls here coming up, 800-282-2882. Since October 7th, the attacks on Israel have increased with no end in sight. Many Israelis are living with the harsh reality of terror every day. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the ground there now addressing all the urgent needs. That's why we're partnering with IFCJ today. While praying for the best, IFCJ is preparing for the worst by packing emergency bomb shelter kits that can be delivered immediately to those in desperate need. Your donation today will help assemble and place these kits with enough food and life-saving emergency supplies for 20 people huddled in a bomb shelter. The cost to put together and distribute these kits is $290 each. Your gift to IFCJ will help save lives. And thanks to a matching gift from a generous IFCJ supporter, your gift will double in impact. The number to call to make your gift is 888 488 IFCJ. That's 888 488 IFCJ. Or go online to supportifcj.org to give. That's supportifcj.org. 